everyone. Uh, right, I'm Dominic Marshenton from Leeds Metropolitan University, and for the last 10 years or so, I've been measuring buildings. So, I uh, call it closing the performance gap. It goes on a bit from what we did at Stamford Brook and draws on the assistance of some of my other colleagues at Leeds Met or some who have left Leeds Met now, who are mentioned there at the bottom. Uh, briefly, I'll be looking at evidence of the performance gap. How can we measure it? Uh, what effects it's had on regulations? A uh, bit on retrofit. And then, uh, Joe's mentioned earlier, this closing the loop thing. He showed Elmtree Muse as an example where you know, if we look at all the different elements, uh, how that can actually give you much more information and give you advice on what you should be doing and where you're going wrong. So, a uh, similar graph here. I haven't put on the test that we did last year on the passive houses or the ones we've put on uh, last year on solid wall. But these are the co-heating tests that uh, Leeds Metropolitan University, our, our research team, have performed. Uh, basically over the last six years or so. Uh, you can see on there, in nearly all the cases, the amount of energy that was used by the houses, or this figure of watts per Kelvin down the left-hand side was greater than what we predicted. Uh, there are a couple here that aren't, and that's because we got the prediction wrong, but I'll go into that in a bit later. Uh, you can see the brackets across the bottom there just showing where a house was retested after a specific intervention or measure. So uh, basically what it tells us is that we don't know how the building fabric actually performs. Uh, we know how we think it's going to perform, but it, it, the heat loss is actually much higher from the building fabric. Uh, uh, and the thing, oh, I've put a ring around those there. Uh, those were actually retrofit ones. That's the reason why we got the predictions wrong. We didn't know what they were being built of, what was in the wall. But uh, I'll move on to the next slide. The way we measure this is our co-heating test. Uh, the co-heating test is quite simple. We heat the building up electrically so we know exactly how much energy is going into the building. We hold it at a steady temperature. We measure external conditions and so we know what the heat loss from the building should be. But just doing that just gives you a figure of what's per Kelvin and it doesn't mean a lot. So it's all the other things that we do with it that colour in the picture, that add the sizzle to the sausage. Other things. So construction observations. Uh, whether it's just taking photos, which is the way we found out that that Elm Street Muse timber fraction was sort of like orders of magnitude greater than it should have been. Just measuring tape in the insulation. Uh, and where we're allowed to drill holes, stick a boroscope through, see if there's actually something wrong there. Pressurisation testing. Uh, it gives you a good measure of general overall quality of the build, but it's when you put it together with leakage detection, uh, using smoke puffers will tell you points of air leakage under pressurisation. Under depressurisation, if it's cold enough outside and warm enough inside, you'll see these patterns of air ingress, uh, which will tell you actual air paths, and so you can do something about them that way. Uh, other things, thermal imaging is great, providing you've got that temperature difference there, and providing you're aware of the limitations of thermal imaging, so different emissivities, moisture, uh, thermal lags and things, which I'll mention later on. Uh, other things, cavity temperatures, measuring a temperature inside a cavity just tells you so much more than looking at the surface. Uh, tracer gas measurements, we use simple pulses of CO2, looked at the decay rate of it to give us actual ventilation rates during the course of the test so we could see if there are any step changes in there. But it's a cheap and inexpensive way of actually measuring your ventilation in real life, real time. Heat flux measurement, similar, tells you how much heat is going through that particular spot in the wall. It won't tell you the whole wall, but it'll tell you what that spot is and if you put that together with temperatures you've effectively got a u-value measuring machine an in situ u-value measuring machine uh, other things will measure airflow in cavities in walls everywhere and then where we're allowed if there are any bits we're not sure about uh, if we can take a block out and look in the wall partial deconstruction will do that and it just tells us so much more but uh, coheating isn't new uh, Lawrence Barclay laboratories in the states did it when the oil crisis energy crisis came along in the 70s uh, they started measuring how the houses has performed after that it seemed to die a death and nobody really paid any interest until we sort of reinvented it for stanford brook uh, well back in there 2005 2006 i think probably one of the reasons why it died a death was uh, the analysis of the data was so complicated afterwards they were looking at you know, looking at it in a very sort of like scientific way <laughs> We tried to simplify that. Uh, so here we do, just plot it on a graph. You've got power input up that side, temperature difference between inside and outside, 
we can draw a line for the predicted performance. The black spots you'll see there are what we actually measured. When we add in the sole again, we get the white spots up above, and then that gives you a line of actual measured performance of the fabric. You can see in this case, this is a mid-terrace from Stamford Brook, one of the first co-heating tests that we did, and we got virtually double what the predicted fabric heat loss should have been. So, uh, the tests you can see coloured in red there are the Stamford Brook ones. The, the two that you can see on the extreme left were the first two tests we did. We followed that up, uh, testing another four houses on four pairs of semis, which we you know, specific, test specifically designed to look at what was happening in the party wall and why it was such a heat loss. I mean, it shouldn't have been such a surprise that the party wall was a heat loss. Uh, there's a, got a paper on my desk there 20 years ago. Uh, people doing in situ measurements got U values of about 0.8 for party walls, but again, nobody really wanted to acknowledge that, wanted to pay any attention. But so we did it, we measured it accurately, we tried to do it in a way that was beyond question, and we shouted a lot about it, and people started to listen. So this was the mid terrace house at Stamford Brook, predicted heat loss of 75 watts per one degree difference in temperature. We actually measured sort of like 153. Uh, the semi-detached, uh, we didn't quite get the same, and so it led us to believe it was something to do with the party wall that was causing this huge amount of heat loss. Thermal images, you can see a bit of thermal bridging at the bottom. This is up in the cold roof space. In the middle, nothing. At the top, there's this huge plume of heat. So, uh, our simple theory was, there's your party wall, there's your loft insulation, it was just heat going from the rooms in the house, going up through the party wall cavity and effectively got anywhere between a 500 or 800 watt radiator heating up your cold roof space. Uh, oh, I've gone backwards. So, uh, to investigate it, we took a party wall, it was partly built, we put just a piece of mineral wool sock, cavity stop sock, at roof level, we put removable blocks so we could take it out Later, with the sock in, no heat plume at the top of the cold roof. With the oop, oh, going too fast. With the sock out, that heat plume reappears. Uh, it wasn't just the only thing. When we took the sock out, we started to see wind washing effects in the party wall, which we weren't really aware of before. Uh, we also saw some strange effects with the sock in position. There was hot air coming out on the one side of the party wall. Uh, which you could see with a the thermal camera, we take the sock out and that disappears. Okay, you know, we were allowed to take a brick out in that case and we could see there was no insulation there. And so the cavity was being vented into the wall, or sort of the party wall cavity was being vented into the external wall. So uh, the measurements that we took, this is uh, just taking cavity temperatures inside the party wall cavity. Uh, above the ceiling, so above the insulation, you can see there for the first week or so of testing, we had the sock in, uh, the temperatures in the cavity, sort of like pretty much following external temperatures. As soon as we take the sock out, the temperatures in the cavity, this is up above the loft insulation with the same temperature as inside the house. Well, not quite as hot, but similar. Similarly, temperatures in the cavity below the loft insulation with the sock in, like nice and stable reflecting the temperature within the house and as soon as we take the sock out they're all over the place they're sort of like yeah. uh, it's the temperature external temperature it's wind effects and things which are driving the temperature inside there then <coughs> so a quick calculation of it would you know, gave us this with the sock in and sock out a reduction in the, the effective view value of that party wall by about 0.5 uh, Measurements of airflow with the sock in. Arrows just signify the amount of airflow that we measured or the maximum speed. Take the sock out, and huge amounts of airflow in that party wall. So it meant that our simple model of how cold air got in and hot air got out, uh, or heat loss from the wall, was nowhere near as simple as we actually thought. Even with the socks in, we were still getting some heat loss in there because it was hard to get the absolutely perfect to get a, a proper airtight seal all around. Anyway, uh, Malcolm Bell, who was running the project, gave this you know, just a back-of-fag packet calculation. 
it could be three quarters of a million tonnes of carbon per year just from that part of war bypass alone. So uh, another project we did here, these houses was by the mineral wool insulation manufacturers who thought maybe just by filling this party wall with insulation we stop the bypass. So we looked at a few of theirs. Uh, basically these are just some houses in Bradford. We heated them up and straight away just thermal images from the outside revealed that you've got this bypass. You could see these heat plumes up at the top and it was just heat, hot air in the party wall escaping through the external wall. Uh, so uh, we stuck as many sensors in the wall that we thought we possibly could do without really affecting the way that the wall performed. So you can see there, positions of the sensors, loads, I'll show you a picture of them. It was, yeah, so we, you know, we were measuring surface and cavity temperatures. We were measuring airflow in vertically and horizontally. We were measuring heat flux into there. We were measuring differential pressures to see what the drivers were for air movement. So, and then after measuring for a few days, uh, we got the insulation people to come along and fill the party wall, uh, filling it to a standard density of about 20 kilograms per meter cube that they would on external walls. And these are the results we saw. Uh, the predicted, and uh, that, against what we measured before we filled the party wall and then when we filled the party wall sort of like a, a big reduction again uh, a similar case there a reduction of about 0.5 watts per meter squared you can see there before and after sort of like the plume had disappeared but it wasn't the only problem there uh, you know, lots of other things you if you can see on this one just a drops off it an rsj going through there the insulation goes right over the top of it, but the air barrier is underneath, and it's just another kind of bypass. Uh, implications for building regs, it actually brought about a change in the building regulations. So 2010 building regulations actually put in a value for the party wall. So unfilled, uh, no edge ceiling, a value of 0.5. I think they were probably erring on the side of caution, really. I don't think they wanted to cause too much of an uproar. Uh, what do I mean? Existing dwellings, I showed that on the graph as well, of performance. Uh, this is a nice little project we did. Uh, if you want to know more about the costs and everything, you can read uh, this brochure here. But it was uh, two prototype dwellings for a 540 house estate. And then, uh, end, well, it was a semi-detached house, 1930s one, which they tried to build, bring up to the same energy standards. They did it in a two-phase. One was just their, what they call, decent homes upgrade, the standard things most people would do. And then the second one was to try and get this 80% reduction in CO2. Uh, if you look at the graph, again, uh, that for the existing dwelling, it was originally 300 plus watts per Kelvin. The standard upgrade brings it down to about 250. Uh, when they did this capital intensive upgrade to try and get it to the 80% reduction, they got near enough to the same type of heat loss figures heat loss coefficient as the prototypes, but it is a slightly smaller dwelling. Uh, oops. Okay. That's the floor plan of this. That's a fit one. So it's, you know, it was brick, brick cavity, wall, 50 mil cavity. It had been extended with a brick block and all kinds of different things. So there's you know, no such thing as a standard retrofit. Uh, first test that we did, uh, and you can see when we did the second test, we'd insulated the roof, we'd insulated cavity walls, not a lot of difference, and it's only until we come to the third and final test with 150 or 175 mil of external wall insulation that we get better. But the interesting thing about this is this is the theoretical reduction. The dotted lines show the predicted figures. The solid lines show what we actually measured. When we first tested it, we actually measured less than a predicted figure. And it's using figures from RD SAP and stuff there, and we're thinking that you know, our prediction is actually wrong. Uh, so RDSAP would say that you know, your house actually performs worse than it does. When we get to the bottom line, and we know what this prediction is here, we're not getting it, there's a performance gap there. So when you've got this actual reduction and theoretical reduction, so for the Green Deal in the UK, it might be a problem where people are getting nowhere near the amount that they're expecting in terms of beneficial performance for many retrofit measures. Uh, similar thing there, this is just a simple graph, it's got, this is 
splitting it down into elements on this house. Uh, so for each of the building elements, what we think the heat loss was going to be through each and where these benefits were going to be. Uh, the biggest one, you can see there, loft insulation, sticking in 400 mil of loft insulation. The windows and doors sticking in Nordan Nord Entech, triple glazed windows. But the walls... Dominic, two minutes. Uh, okay. uh, when we actually measured them, uh, you can see there that these U values that we got from the walls. This is the cavity wall inside the house where the extension was. Uh, we actually stopped the heat loss from there pretty much. But on the external walls, they were still way over the top. Uh, reasons why. Uh, cavity wall insulation didn't work. I had to actually top it up. Uh, loft insulation at the eaves. Or when we actually put the... Uh, the external wall insulation on, extended the eaves, lifted, lifted up the roof, and you could see that it wasn't a full... There wasn't a continuous insulation layer. But saying after we'd fixed all that, uh, you, you turned the internal... You can see from the internal thermal images there, it's actually quite good. Top ones before, but ones after, by the way. Uh, so, uh, did they get down to their 80% reduction? Uh, not far off, but there were... You know, that was the boiler in the garage on the top, uh, without the insulated pipes. Uh, down at the bottom, uh, you've got the hot water tank in the loft with no insulation pipes, and so moving those around. They got close to it, but if you read uh, the report, it'll give you costs and everything. Uh, Joseph mentioned this closing the loop thing on Elm Tree Mews in York. This is another project at York. Uh, I forgot about that. Uh, Hempcrete bungalow with a potential for a party wall to be put in there should uh, the developer want to split it into two and sell it as houses after it's been used as sheltered accommodation. But, you know, we're interested in the party wall, we're interested in ventilation. If we look at the external wall measurements, this hempcrete, the U value is twice what it was supposed to be. Uh, if we look at the thermal images, you can see on the bottom here that you you can see the actual layers of where it was tamped down, so differences in density and differences in moisture in there. Uh, but it still didn't account for this 64% of or extra heat loss than was predicted. The thing we'd missed out on completely was the thermal bridging. It was well designed, but the insulation didn't go right up to the eaves. It was impossible to lay it from inside on a low pitch roof. Uh, if you look at the side values, uh, the Lime Creek Technology standard side value was used of 0.25 or 0 0.026, 0 0.026, sorry. Uh, if you adjust it for the pitch, it doubles, it trebles when you put in the fact that they didn't put this uh, hempcrete right to the top of the wall. And when you put uh, in the insulation as it was in practice in the loft, you've actually got four times the side value uh, that was in the design calculations. I don't think we're over time. Uh, okay. So... Uh, <laughs> so the heat loss from the wall which concentrated on was double uh, but it was nothing compared to the increase in the thermal bridging uh, oops, so, uh, I was just going to mention some simple tests there you don't need to do tests pay with two weeks of unoccupied dwellings and thousand pounds worth of equipment you can do it cheaply this is the type of thing that we've been doing lately, working with City West in Salford, looking at their party walls, and just using a couple of thousand pounds worth of equipment over a week, measure it, fill the wall, measure it again. This is the U value of the party wall. And so they get the same type of thing with 2,000 pounds of equipment over a week. Uh, you don't need to go into it. Uh, other issues, uh, drive-by thermal imaging and stuff like that aren't the answer. This is just to show you quickly. Difference in temperature between inside and outside on the house is this graph along the bottom. It could be six hours before you get the difference in temperature being expressed on the wall surface. So it's this thermal lag and things which you don't work. So anyway, that's me finished. If you want to read off about the coheating test, it's on there. Uh, but uh, I think twice before investing a lot of money in doing it. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much.